Good morning. Wow, what a view. I'm so, so, so humbled and excited to be here with you today. Um, a few years ago, I found myself, as one does, in an Ethiopian shoe factory. And at this shoe factory, uh, when I was working there, I would spend most of my days in the very back of the factory in this little windowless room, generously referred to as the design lab. And I would be working away on projects, and every day the bell rings at noon at this particular factory. And that means that it's time for everybody to get up, and we all go to the canteen, and we eat lunch together. And this particular day, I was working on a particularly challenging footwear design. And I had a deadline coming up, and so I was like, you know what? I heard the bell ring for lunch, and I was like, I got to get through this project. I got to keep my head down. I'm just going to, you know, eat a power bar and, and stay in here. And so I'm working, I'm working, I'm working away. I have no idea how much time has passed when all of a sudden the power goes out. Just And in addition to getting completely pitch black, it was also completely silent. So, of course, my first thought is like, well, rapture, you know, that happened. Um, and apparently all my Ethiopian friends had a good thing going on with Jesus, and I'm left behind here. And then my second, more um, correct thought was, oh my gosh, it's Saturday. And on Saturday, when that bell rings at noon, it's not so that we can all go to lunch. It's so that everybody can go home for the entire rest of the weekend. So I managed my way out of this windowless room to the front of the factory where indeed my worst suspicions had been confirmed. I had gone and gotten myself locked in an Ethiopian shoe factory where I would be spending the next two nights. So I am freaking out a little bit and all of a sudden I hear these two voices really far off in the distance. And so I kind of panic and I pick up a shoe last, which luckily for me is really hard and heavy. And I start banging it up against the steel doors and I'm screaming the only Amharic word that is coming to me in my panic, which ironically is um, salam, which quite literally translates to may the peace of God be with you. So I'm screaming and just, be the peace of God, be with you. And the voices get a little bit louder and a little bit louder. And it's these two little old ladies from the factory. They're, they're the secretaries that um, are at the front of the factory. And through this steel door, I managed to explain to them, like, hey, got myself locked in the factory. And they managed to explain that, unfortunately, the guy that has the one key went home like two hours ago. You guys, after a lot of phone calls, probably two, three, maybe four hours, those women stayed with me on the other side of the gate. And eventually, the guy with the key came back, and I was rescued. And this was uh, the celebration that ensued. Can we play the cue up the video? Oh, I don't know where it's at. <laughs> favorite part, wait for it, and booty slap. <laughs> About five years prior to getting myself locked in this Ethiopian shoe factory, I had designed, which I think is a generous word for what this is, a pair of strappy sandals. Literally, I made them when I was in college. I had the, I think, incredibly profound thought that I would love a pair of flip-flops that <laughs> don't flop. And so I took a pair of rubber shower sandals and I tore off the thong and I replaced it with some funky strappy ribbon and voila, flip-flops that didn't flop. Um, to be very clear, I was not a designer. In fact, I actually had no interest at all in fashion, as evidenced by this photo that perhaps, better judgment, I'm getting ready to share with you. Um, <laughs> So this photo, you guys, was taken of me not after I emerged from my bedroom after like a violent stomach bug, which is kind of what this look says to me. No, no, this was taken of me on the day I got engaged. Mm -hmm. Yep, <laughs> that, was, that was the best I could do, apparently. Um, nevertheless, for reasons that we will get to later, with no interest in fashion or business, I had designed these sandals, set up manufacturing, and um, started selling these sandals out of the back of my car quite literally. This is a photo that was taken actually down here in Southern California on the highway right outside of LA. My husband and I, in the very, very early days of our business, we were um, on our way to an event when we got stuck in terrible, horrible standstill LA traffic. 
when I realized that like we had several hundred pairs of sandals in the back of the car that we needed to sell and that gridlock represents um, an incredibly captive audience. <laughs> And so I got out of the car and started walking down the highway shoulder, tapping on windows, offering to sell beautiful fair trade sandals for the low, low price of whatever cash you happen to have on hand. Um, but somehow, despite all odds, it actually worked. My husband and I spent the next several years traveling across the country, building up this chain of over 500 stores that were carrying the product. We had this one single product, and it had taken us further than we could have ever imagined. But at a certain point in our business, we realized that we were going to need to expand and pivot our business model. Uh, we kind of saw the writing on the wall for the traditional retail industry, because every year, every month, accounts that had been open for 10, 15 years were closing their doors. And we realized that in order for retail to survive the e-commerce revolution that was happening at the time, we either had to compete in the race to the bottom and be the fastest and cheapest and most convenient, or we had to create something that was unique and experiential. We started dreaming about what it would look like to put our product into the hands of women here in the United States, because we realized that women here at home were facing a serious problem. And that problem was thousands, hundreds of thousands of women who want their lives to matter. They want to be a part of a story that's bigger than themselves. They want to use their gifts and their skills to make an impact in the world, but they might feel a little bit overwhelmed or paralyzed about how to go about doing that. But to make this shift from wholesale to the direct sales model was an incredibly immense risk. We had spent at this point probably five years building up this retail channel. We had spent so much time and money and energy. And now this retail channel now represented over 75% of our annual revenue. And we knew that if we pursued this new dream and this new vision, that virtually overnight we would find ourselves in a completely new industry. We would need a new team. We would need a new financing model. We would need an entirely new product catalog. So here I was in Ethiopia, still without a design degree, prototyping and designing and getting myself locked into Ethiopian shoe factories. And while it might make for a good story, uh, and during this season of life, I was experiencing some serious fear, and not just of spending two nights in the factory. I was really, really, really afraid of failing. And I was afraid of failing because I had this narrative in my mind that if we tried and failed, if we made this shift, if we pivoted and then just bit it and totally failed, that everyone would look at me and they would say, see, I told you. Everything that she's built, those sandals that she designed, building that manufacturing company, that wholesale retail company, it was all just beginner's luck. Beginner's luck refers to the supposed phenomenon of novices experiencing success. And this phrase kind of started to haunt me. I imagined taking this leap and failing and hearing people go, see, obviously it was just beginner's luck. Well, I don't want to spoil the story, but we ended up pulling our products off of store shelves. And we put them into the hands at first of just a few dozen women. We had a mom of four from rural Indiana and a wedding photographer and foster mom from Texas and a social justice researcher and advocate from Michigan. And in their first full year of selling the products, sharing the Seiko story, and styling their friends, these few dozen women generated more in revenue and impact than we had ever done through our wholesale channel. We realized that in addition to creating community and opportunity for women across the globe, we could do the same for women right here at home. But nearly every time in my career when this opportunity to take a really big risk and to kind of pivot and evolve happens, soon to follow is this nasty little insecurity of mine that says, yeah, but if you try and fail, everyone will know it was just beginner's luck. So a few years ago, I started thinking more about this specific insecurity. But perhaps more importantly, I started thinking more about myself and the point in my career before this specific insecurity emerged. And I had to go back, pretty far back, all the way to my 22-year-old self, who had quit my corporate job and moved to Uganda without a plan, without a job, just a journalism degree, and this belief that I could be a part of a story that was bigger than myself. I started wondering if perhaps the success that I had envisioning and launching Seiko, and by the way, not without 
plenty of failures along the way. You know those closed-toed shoes I was working on in Ethiopia. I worked on that project for almost two years, and it failed miserably. So miserably, in fact, that I may have performed a bad ideas funeral and buried a pair of those beautiful pink loafers in my backyard. You may think I'm kidding, but this is what a bad ideas <laughs> funeral looks like. I do deserve, I believe that even our bad ideas deserve the dignity of being laid properly to rest. Um, but I started wondering if maybe my success in my early days of visioning and launching Seiko had less to do with beginner's luck and more to do with a little something I like to call beginner's pluck. Uh, pluck, it's such a good word. I'm on a mission to bring it back into modern lexicon. I'm not referring to the verb pluck, which is what you do to that pesky chin hair when you think your partner isn't watching. Um, no, I'm referring to the noun pluck, which means spirited and determined courage. I started thinking that maybe what my younger self lacked in prior experience or expertise or the right connections that she made up for with spirited and determined courage. I started thinking if maybe the mentalities that I had in my earliest days, long before I would have self-identified as an entrepreneur or leader or designer, could be helpful 10 years in, now running this company that operates on multiple continents and has hundreds of employees and partners and distributors and uh, investors and burn rates and insurance premiums, if learning how to intentionally channel my inner beginner could help me become a more effective and creative and courageous leader for the long haul. I want to talk about the four stages of learning. You've likely probably heard of the four stages of learning, and you've probably seen something like this um, to, to illustrate it. So we all start out in stage one, which is the land of unconscious incompetence. This is kind of the happy-go-lucky place uh, where you don't really know what you don't know. I have a three-year-old son, and he is living his absolute best life every day in unconscious incompetence. And then we have this like moment of awareness. We get into the dream school. We raise our hand, and we ask for more responsibility. We get the promotion. We launch the company. And all of a sudden, we have this moment where we become very aware of our incompetence. We enter into this stage of conscious incompetence. And this is the worst stage of all. We hate this stage because in this stage, our egos are super fragile and our insecurities seem to rage. And the best advice that we seem to get from all of the experts is basically like, Ugh, like fake it till you make it. Just get through this stage as quick as possible. Keep practicing. You'll get better. Eventually, you will get to the stage of conscious competence where you're like, okay, I can do this. Like, it takes a little bit of work but I'm starting to figure this out. But practice makes perfect. So just keep going, and eventually you will emerge into the golden state of unconscious competence. This, from, uh, from this stage, there we go. <laughs> me and the Lord are a little out of sync here. Um, from this stage, we get to become the leaders and the influencers and the mentors that we always dreamed about, right? Wrong. What I want you to understand is that this image of the stages of learning is actually pretty toxic. Because when we believe in this image, we start to act out a fear of losing our place at the top of the almighty mountain of competence and mastery. And those feelings that we felt down there in the land of conscious incompetence become even scarier because now they're a signal that we got knocked down a few notches. Or perhaps even worse, it's a sign that you never actually really made it. You've kind of just been faking it all along, and now you're getting ready to get found out. What I want you to understand is that the stages of learning are not a mountain to be scaled or climbed, but they are actually a cycle. And the most courageous and creative and innovative leaders know that the point isn't actually to achieve mastery and success and to stay there. But rather, the point of being leaders is to constantly be moving through the cycle of learning. And I would argue that the most courageous and creative and pluckiest of leaders, they celebrate not just when they reach mastery and expertise, which is important, but they also celebrate when they find themselves back in the land of conscious incompetence. They celebrate because they know that they did what only true leaders and visionaries do. When they reached mastery and expertise, instead of staying there and acting out of fear and ego, they voluntarily dove headfirst back into the cycle of learning, back into the stage of conscious incompetence. 
or what I like to call the magical land of beginners. So in my book, Beginners Pluck, which actually launches tomorrow, um, I share my story of starting and growing and scaling our ethical fashion brand called Seiko Designs. And I also share the 14 principles that I truly believe will help you own your inner beginner and that will completely reframe the way you think about the cycle of learning. The very things that used to ignite your fragile ego and your insecurities will become the things that make you say, honey, I'm home. I'm back in the magical land of beginners. I obviously can't share all 14 principles with you today, but I do just want to let you know that the principles in this book are just really inspiring and feel good. Um, we're going to talk about how important it is to... Um, Oh, we're going to talk about dreaming small, actually. Um, but don't worry, because I'm going to tell you, like, each and every one of you, you just need to go out there, and you need to find, oh, wait, actually, I'm going to break the news that you're never going to find your passion. But this one, this one is really good. This one is super inspiring, and I definitely want you to believe this. Every single one of you in this room is so incredibly average. I mean, like, statistically speaking... This is how averages work. We're all mostly hanging out somewhere in the middle of the bell curve, right? But the good thing is, what pluckies know is that you don't need to be above average or special or extraordinarily talented to build an extraordinary life of purpose and passion and impact. Still thinking about adding that message to our uh, t-shirt collection for the fall. Um, but here's the thing. A lot of the principles of Beginner's Pluck, I think, are going to surprise you. And that's because over the last 10 years of running my own social enterprise and now teaching and coaching and training thousands of people to do the same, I've been learning firsthand how this ubiquitous, like, find your passion and dream big. And once you find your dream job, you'll never work another day in your life narrative is actually affecting people. And I have to tell you that I think we have some things very wrong. This like inspirational, motivational narrative that I think is intended to inspire and motivate is actually creating serious anxiety and analysis paralysis. Uh, let's tackle this one first, because here's the thing. You cannot walk down the self-help aisle or open up Instagram without hearing some inspirational guru shout this at you, right? Like, dream big, dream bigger. Um, and while if you've known me for more than 10 seconds, you know that I am all about dreaming really big. But the problem is I have met thousands of people over the last 10 years who have been paralyzed by this message. Paralyzed asking, but like, how? How, how do I get the big dream in the first place? Or perhaps even worse, they like have a dream and they're, they're looking at it and going like, yeah, but I don't, I don't know, like, is it actually big enough? One of the first principles of Beginner's Pluck is to actually start by dreaming small. When I get introduced on stage or before a podcast, oftentimes somebody will refer to me as this, you know, big dreamer who quit her corporate job and moved to Uganda. And while it's really fun and nice for my ego to be seen as somebody who's, you know, this big dreamer, I want to share with you the story of how that actually went down. And we've got to back up to before that kind of big moment in the story. When I was in college, I was passionate about issues that were facing women and girls living in extreme poverty and conflict. I took classes, I wrote papers, I marched in protests, I went on to get my master's degree, all the while plotting and planning this big dream, this huge dream about this corporate philanthropy scheme that would help bring millions and millions of women and girls out of poverty. I graduated from grad school and went out to look for my dream job, and that didn't happen, and I took a job at a corporate communications firm. And I was about three months into that job when I was doing some research, and I had this moment sitting there at my cubicle, my first job, and I won't get into the details, but what happened was I was watching this video about the effect of investing in women and girls in developing economies, nothing new for me intellectually, when I had this come-to-Jesus moment where I realized that although I said I was super passionate about this thing, I wrote papers and I talked about it and I had this big dream, I did not actually know a single girl who grew up in this context. I realized that in the midst of my like big dreaming about bringing a million women and girls out of poverty, that the sacred importance and value of just one got lost somewhere along the way. 
And I was sitting there in my cubicle with tears streaming down my face, and I realized that there was a pretty big delta between what I said I cared about and the actual life that I was living. And so sitting there in my little cubicle, I bought a one-way plane ticket to Uganda. <laughs> um, I moved to Uganda. Can you imagine after uh, I told my parents that I quit my job in the height of a recession to move to Uganda? By the way, I'd never really left the United States of America. My family did not like grow up traveling. We like vacationed in Destin, Florida and took our minivan. So they were like, you're moving to Uganda? Like to do what? And I was like, mom and dad, I'm going to make a friend. And they were like, can't you just join like a running club like your sister? <laughs> But here's the thing that pluckies know is that small dreams have a surprising power of catapulting us out of waiting and into creating. In that moment, without even realizing that's what I was doing, that big dream that was so big and so massive and was going to make such a big impact actually didn't compel me to make any real moves because I was waiting for permission. I was waiting to get another job, more responsibility, permission from a boss, a multi-million dollar budget. The reality is when I took that really big dream and I made it as small as it could possibly go, I also removed every single excuse. That big dream became a microscopically small dream of simply making a single friend. So uh, I showed up in Uganda, and I ended up meeting an incredible group of young women in between high school and university. These young women came from all over the country. They came from backgrounds of extreme poverty and conflict, most of them having lost one or both of their parents, either to AIDS or the war in northern Uganda. But despite that, they were in the top 5% of students in the entire country. And what happened was they were getting ready to graduate from this amazing leadership academy. They were testing into college, and and then they were going back home to their villages for the nine-month gap between high school and university. And when they went back home to their villages, two things were happening. One, they were going back to look for jobs to pay for college, and they couldn't find jobs. Most of them lived in uh, communities where there's over an 80% youth unemployment rate. And the economic opportunity that did exist, they were competing with young men in the village for that same opportunity. And two, there was this loss of social support. These young women had spent the last two years with other really bright, ambitious, like-minded young women, and then they go back home to their villages where they may be the, the only women in their entire community who have made it this far in school, and they face an immense pressure through dowry and bride price to get married and to start having kids and to not continue on to university. When I met these 25 women, all of a sudden, that huge meta problem of women and girls living in extreme poverty and lack of access to economic and educational opportunity became a lot more narrow and a lot more focused. Figure out how to bridge the gap for 25 women in between high school and university. So I, like a good American showing up in Africa for the first time, started a charity because I thought that that's the only way we can solve really important problems. Luckily, I was still wearing this journalism hat, right? I had my journalism degree, and so I was you know, thinking and asking questions and trying to, to get to the bottom of it. And I ended up learning through a series of events and relationships um, that ultimately what we need to be doing for this specific problem with this specific community is creating sustainable marketplace solutions, creating jobs and using business to help enable and build economies and communities and create jobs. Um, I had zero interest in business, so that, as I mentioned before. So my first business that I started was a chicken farm, and um, that went about as well as you can imagine a chicken farm going by a girl who had to Google on like Wikipedia, like, what do chickens eat? Um, I mean, to be fair, I don't feel like the chickens were that much worse off with me than they were with this guy. Um, it's about 90 live chickens on the back of that motorcycle. Turns out I was not the girl for the chicken farming job. And so actually one of my friends from back home was like, what about those strappy, funky sandals that you made in college? Is that something you could do? And so I spent the next several months traveling the country by motorcycle, looking for raw materials, prototyping out these sandals, got a very rudimentary manufacturing system set up, and then I went to the school and I hired three young women, Mary, Mercy, and Rebecca. And I taught them how to make these sandals, and then I made a promise that changed the entire trajectory of my life. I said, here's the deal. If you make these sandals for the next nine months, I promise that you will go to university next year. And they were like, Okay, and I was like, 
okay. And uh, moved back home to the U.S. with several suitcases full of sandals and started selling sandals on the side of the highway, which is definitely what your parents want you doing with your master's degree in journalism. Guys, four days after I moved back from Uganda, my now husband, who's here in the room somewhere, where are you, Ben? Oh, there he is. My now husband and company co-founder, Ben, proposed to me. Yep, remember this star-studded red carpet event. Ben's literally down on his knees asking me to marry him. And, you know, I've been in Uganda. We hadn't been, like, talking that regularly. I had some things happening. And I was like, he's, you know, saying all these romantic things down on his knees. And I'm like, okay, oh, should I, like, tell him now that I promised three women in Uganda that I would pay for them to go to university if this little, like, sandal idea doesn't pan out? Like, do we have that conversation now? Do I wait until after we're married and our bank accounts are conjoined? So I waited until after. Um, <laughs> so a few months later, Ben quit his full-time job. Uh, we sold everything that we owned, including the wedding presents that we had gotten a few months earlier to buy a Honda Element, and we uh, lived out of our car, traveling the country, trying to launch this brand, get retailers to carry our product, speak, and share the story where wherever we could go. Um, about 10 years later, Seiko is now one of the largest non-agricultural manufacturers in the entire country of Uganda. We have an amazing absolutely incredible all-star executive, entirely Ugandan management team. In addition to those strappy little sandals, we are now a full-on women's lifestyle fashion brand. We have beautiful apparel and footwear and handbags. In fact, we're doing a trunk show this evening at 4 o'clock, and you guys can see uh, the entire collection in person. We would love to have you guys there. You guys got emailed invites, and Amy told me backstage that the invites went out, and she had several people RSVP to the trunk show saying, this sounds really great, but I can't attend. I'm going to be with my husband at a conference in San Diego. Um, so you are here. It is here. This is good news for you. You can be in multiple places at once. Um, we have enabled hundreds of female scholars in Uganda and now in Ethiopia to continue on to university and become leaders in their communities. And we've enabled thousands of female impact entrepreneurs here in the United States to start and launch and grow their own businesses that have purpose and that are making an impact. And now we are dreaming even bigger about growing the fellows program here in the US so that we can ensure that every girl has the opportunity to learn and to lead. But make no mistake, all of that, it all started with one impossibly small dream of making a single friend. If you are on the starting block, or perhaps you are at a crossroads and you are feeling lost or stuck or overwhelmed, or perhaps you are leading those that do. As leaders, I would encourage you to give those that you are leading and mentoring the permission to actually dream small. Because those small dreams have a surprising power of catapulting us out of waiting and into creating. Now, apparently there are other amazing people that you're going to want to hear from. So I, I'm not going to tell you uh, all 14 principles. I'm actually just going to skip from principle, I think, three to all the way to the end of the book. And this is specifically for any of you in this room who I think are probably most of us, who are at a point in our lives and careers where we desire to make an impact, not just for us and for our immediate families, but to make the world a little bit better and brighter for those who are around us as well. And for those of you, um, I want to share with you this principle and this idea that no one needs or wants you to be their hero. Over the last several years of running this international do-good business, I have become increasingly uncomfortable with this dichotomy that exists between the do-gooders and the world changers and those they are serving, between the givers and the receivers. Because, friends, God calls us to live in community. And community with people that live across the street and across the world. And community is this place where we do this sacred dance of giving and receiving. Of needing and being needed. Anytime we show up and we get confused and think our season or the circumstance that we were born into is actually the permanent role that we were meant to play in relationship we strip others and ourselves, frankly, of the dignity of being these brilliant and complex and multifaceted humans. Each of us incredibly broken 
and brilliantly bright. I want to share with you um, a little story about a a woman named Agnes. Agnes uh, I met just a few years after starting Seiko. Uh, She was introduced to me by a friend of a friend. And I got to learn a little bit more about Agnes's story. Aggie grew up in a village about an hour outside of Kampala. And when Aggie was 13 years old, a village elder who was about her dad's age, he was about 40, approached her father and offered him 20 cows in exchange for her. Now, this was an enormous bride price, and everyone in the village was totally shocked when Aggie's dad said, no, actually, like, I want to keep my daughter in school. He was a single dad also, major dad goals there. So Aggie went on. She graduated from high school. She became the first woman in her entire community to graduate from university. Then she graduated out into the workforce. And at the time that I met her, she had been searching for a job for about four grueling months. She's educated. She has this degree. And every single job that she goes to, the male hiring manager either completely overlooks her or says, yeah, I'll offer you a job in exchange for sexual favors. By the time I met Aggie, she was pretty demoralized, still incredibly determined, and she asked me if there was any opportunity for us to hire her. And I was like, you seem awesome, that's great, but we're still this tiny little scrappy sandal company. I have no money, we're not hiring for anybody right now. And she looked at me and she said, listen, let me work for you for free for one month, and I promise you that I will add value to this company. And that is the type of pluck that I cannot refuse. Uh, About eight years later, that plucky young woman is now the managing director of our entire company in Uganda, and she co-chairs the board with me. She has traveled all over Africa negotiating raw materials and uh, working with our suppliers. She's been to the United States where she stood on stages inspiring and educating and equipping thousands of entrepreneurs to live lives and build businesses that truly have an impact. And while her impact is quite literally stretching across oceans, back home in Uganda, Aggie's village is changing. According to Aggie, about 10 years ago, the average girl in her village was being married at the age of 13, some as early as eight or nine. Less than 10 years later, the average girl in her village is in school where she belongs. And that's because those young women and their families have seen through Aggie's story what happens when a girl has the opportunity to learn and to lead. Aggie, in her courage and her boldness and her pluck, has created an eternal wake of dignity and possibility and freedom. For young women in Uganda who I will never meet and who, frankly, I am not equipped to inspire in the way that Aggie is because she has a voice and a level of influence and can make an impact that I simply can't. You want to talk about pluck. I would say that Aggie is the patron saint of pluck. You guys, truly transformational leadership, it's not about being a leader who's primarily concerned with getting to the top, with achieving mastery or notoriety or success. It's about doing the hard and courageous work ourselves of constantly taking those risks out of comfort, out of mastery, out of expertise, and becoming more of who we were created to be, knowing that that will light a path for others to do the same. When I was thinking about, you know, how to land the plane, the only thing that really felt appropriate was sharing the wise and inspirational words of the inspirational figure, Emilio Estevez better known to some of us as Coach Gordon Bombay of the Mighty Ducks, who once said, ducks fly together. But I think, of course, what he really meant to say, ducks fly together, right? And when the sky gets dark and the wind blows hard, say it with me, ducks fly together. And just when they say it can't be done, Plucks fly together! Thank you guys so much.